Nearly 1,000 years after Aristarchus suggested a heliocentric model to explain the retrograde motion of the planets, 500 years after Copernicus, and in spite of every observation made since, there are still people in scholastically impaired backwaters of society who believe that the cosmos rotates around a fixed Earth. Such outdated and demonstrably false beliefs are rooted in a lack of education, and often go hand in hand with creationism. It's a classic recipe. Take someone undereducated, add in the arrogant belief that they can better hundreds of years of real science using a storybook, and sprinkle generously with claims of a science conspiracy. Speaking of which, here's Golden Crocodile nominee Fernieboy100, who either doesn't understand the limited science that he has read, or deliberately misrepresents it to suit his Bible literalism. This is the same Bible that says the Earth has foundations. That we can't eat delicious, nutritious pork. That we can eat cows. And that we can't. That bats are birds. And that the best cure for dermatological complaints is to get a priest to sprinkle you with bird blood and shave you. In the first part of his Geocentrist Truth series, his argument hangs almost literally on our current pole star, Polaris. He has this to say. So the question comes up that why would Polaris stay in the same place if the Earth is tilting? Um, Polaris is way up in outer space, and the Earth is down here, and like I say, Polaris is a long ways away from Earth. And so if the Earth is tilting throughout the year, enough to cause seasons, this is a very significant tilt, why are we not seeing Polaris move all over the sky? Because he personally doesn't understand basic celestial mechanics, the Earth's axial tilt, or the seasons, Phony Boy concludes that science is lying, and that his own position is therefore fact. It's a typical argument from ignorance. It's easy to dismiss science as lies if your worldview is such that you can't or don't understand it, and it's the default position of many creationists. Fernieboy thinks that science says the Earth's tilt varies enough over the course of the year to cause the seasons. Of course, it doesn't say that at all. But first, let's see how geocentrism explains the seasons. To geocentrists, the seasons are caused by the Sun physically moving up and down from the celestial equator. It sounds simple, but what are the actual implications of that? Here are the Sun and the Earth. At this scale, the Earth is about 1 20th of a pixel across. In our creationist's model, the Earth is fixed, and at the March equinox, the Sun is here, on the celestial equator. The Sun circles the Earth with the rest of the universe once a day. Over the next three months, the Sun spirals around, getting higher in the sky, giving summer in the northern hemisphere. If maintaining roughly the same distance from the Earth, this means that the radius of the circle it describes decreases as it heads towards the solstices, by about 12.4 million kilometers. Somehow. As if that didn't defy enough laws of motion, it then spirals down towards the celestial equator again, through the autumnal equinox, and on to the winter solstice. This cycle then repeats each year. If you want to say, well the sun just moves up and down instead, which would be simpler, then you have another problem. It'll end up over 163 million kilometers from the Earth, and with an angular diameter of about 29.27 minutes, instead of its current minimum of around 31.5 minutes. That doesn't happen. But the geocentrist picture gets more complex, because the distance to the Sun does vary on a cyclic basis. The Sun is furthest from the Earth in early July, and closest in early January. Measure its angular diameter if you don't believe it. This makes the motion of the Sun even more complex for the geocentrist. The Sun isn't furthest or closest at each solstice. If we project those back, and use a simple harmonic motion to find monthly intervals from the solstices, we can plot the changing distance of the Sun through the course of a year, and it'll look rather like this. Combine that with the daily circling of the Earth, and the crazy sun spiral idea is how geocentrists think the seasons work. Naturally, they have no explanation for how or why any of this takes place, let alone anything that can explain the complex motions needed for their idea to match what we observe. No laws of motion, no maths, no physics, just their twee little diagrams. Perhaps Helios is just making his chariot driving work more interesting. Or perhaps the geocentrist idea to explain the seasons is bollocks. As most people learned at school, the Earth is tilted at around 23.5 degrees. When the northern hemisphere is facing the sun, it's summer in the north and winter in the south. Six months later, Earth is on the opposite side of the sun, and it's winter in the northern hemisphere. It's so simple, children understand it, so you don't need me to tell you where the spring and autumn equinoxes go in this cycle. 
Fernie Boy seems to have encountered an incorrect description of the seasons, which is probably due to sourcing his info from geocentrist websites. He's all too ready to dismiss proven facts without really understanding them. I mean, this is just delusion. Honestly, like, th this is hilarious. That, that people will actually think that scientific hypothesis and theory is equal to fact. It's not. Hypothesis and theory is not fact. I don't know why so many people can't see this, that um, it's not fact. It's simple as that. And, and so, like, this is what you'll see all over the place. You're going to see all pictures like this and, like, where it shows polarity. It's always on an angle. You'll see the Earth on an angle, on its tilt, and then they, they show the players above the Earth on that tilt. But this is not what's going on. The, the universe is rotating around Earth. Unfortunately, one can't simply state, that's not what's going on, unless you have a testable, alternative model that shows what is going on. Personal belief based on utter ignorance does not reality make. Our creationist friend doesn't understand why, if the Earth is orbiting on a tilt, Polaris is always near the North Celestial Pole. It's very simple. During the course of the year, the orientation of Earth's axis remains virtually constant. At the summer solstice, the North Celestial Pole is pointing towards Polaris. Three months later, at the autumnal equinox, it's pointing at Polaris. Come the winter solstice, it's still pointing at Polaris. And at the vernal equinox, it's pointing at Mars. Not really. Polaris. The orientation of Earth's axis, that is, the direction it's pointing to in space, does change, but not on the annual timescale that Fernie Boy thinks it does. The Earth is not a perfect sphere, and the gravitational pulls of the Sun and the Moon act on its equatorial bulge. This causes small cycles such as nutation, and the most significant shift of the orientation of Earth's axis, the precession of the equinoxes, a cycle that takes about 26,000 years to complete. We see the effect of this as a shift of the celestial poles, and with them the celestial equator and the points of the equinoxes. Hipparchus is credited with discovering this precession over a century BC, and his work was continued by Ptolemy in the second century. Two thousand years later, the cycles are now well understood and can be measured and calculated with precision. The celestial pole wasn't always near Polaris. Five thousand years ago it was pointing at Thuban in Draco. In another twelve thousand years the pole will be near Vega. It moves about one degree every 72 or so years. It would be nice if geocentrists did some actual measurements. Back to Fernie Boy's cute diagram of what he thinks is really going on. It really doesn't take much more than simple observations to realise that Mercury is not between Earth and Venus. Actually, it doesn't take much more than simple observations to realise that the entire diagram is based on a foundation of uneducated, outdated rubbish. The inner planets pose problems for the geocentrist model. Mercury and Venus are always seen near the Sun, and it's obvious that they don't orbit the Earth. We see phases of both planets and changing distances from Earth that are entirely consistent with them orbiting the Sun. This magnificent sequence of images taken by Chris Proctor shows the phases and changes in apparent size of Venus that we observe. Venus appears fully illuminated when it appears smallest in the sky and only a small angle from the Sun. The geocentrist has Venus orbiting Earth, like so. An observer on Earth would see phases of Venus like this. If Venus orbited Earth rather than the Sun, we wouldn't see the changes in size that we see. We'd see Venus in the middle of the night on a regular basis, but we don't. We might expect to see Venus go through Earth's shadow from time to time, but we don't see that either. We never see Venus more than 47.8 degrees from the Sun. It's not called the morning star and the evening star for nothing. It's the same principle with Mercury, which we never see more than about 27 degrees from the Sun. And according to this rubbish, we should also see Mercury transit across Venus from time to time. That never happens either, and never will, because this childish model of the solar system is bollocks, and is easily shown to be bollocks by looking at the sky and making measurements. For the geocentrist then, Mercury and Venus must be following the Sun on its annual crazy spiral, and engaging in some unexplained motion of their own. Or perhaps the geocentrist thinks that they are orbiting the Sun, and it's just everything else that supposedly doesn't. The planetary problems don't stop with Mercury and Venus. I mentioned at the start of this video retrograde motion. This was key to disproving the geocentric view of the ancients, which should obviously result in a steady motion. With actual observations, we see something that puzzled the ancient Greeks. Here's how Mars moves against the background stars from the 11th of October 2011. 
to the 11th of July 2012 at weekly intervals. We see it slow down, reverse in January 2012, and then resume its easterly motion from mid-April. We can measure the distances to the planets easily, so what does this motion look like over months when seen from above a stationary Earth? It's far from the nice neat circles posited by this crap. Ptolemy's answer to apparent retrograde motion was the concept of epicycles, the notion that the planets orbit about a point, which itself circles the Earth. Ptolemy's calculations took up 13 volumes, but did provide a way to describe and predict retrograde motion. However, being so early in tackling the problem, Ptolemy can be forgiven for being unaware of one slight factor. Gravity, you f***ing retard! Whilst Ptolemy's voluminous calculations remained of use, they were far too complicated and unsatisfactory to astronomers of the Middle Ages, and we don't use the concept of epicycles today because it's bollocks. The geocentric model where planets go on looping tours of the heavens becomes even more questionable when you include the supposed daily rotation of the entire universe. A fire starter! Twisty fire starter! Yeah, the fire starter! Yeah. For non physics defying elegance, try this. Oh, look, Halley's Comet in nineteen eighty six. In the second part of this series, we'll look at even more shortcomings of geocentrism. See you then.